The 27 Club is a production of iHeartRadio and Double Elvis Media. Jim Morrison died at the age of 27, and he lived a life unlike any other, a life of provocation, rock and roll, and danger. I can give you 27 reasons why that statement is true. One would be the pair of brown leather pants that he wore so often that would become his calling card. More than music, Jim Morrison was a sex symbol first, provocateur second, and a singer third. Six more would be the number of words that he sang live on national TV that got the Doors banned from the Ed Sullivan Show for good. Another two would be the number of times he tried to steal Jimi Hendrix's thunder on stage. The first time, he just waltzed on up there. The second time, he begged. And both times, he was denied. One more would be the number of files the FBI opened up on him after he had taunted one too many cops and attempted to incite one too many riots. Jim could run from authority all he wanted, but authority had its eyes on him, constantly. And 17 would be the number of months he had left to live after he wrapped his 1967 Shelby Mustang around a telephone pole in the heart of Hollywood. On this, our fourth episode of season two, bad words, FBI files, wrecked cars, and Jim Morrison lost in another fantasy. I'm Jake Brennan, and this is The 27 Club. Jim Morrison impatiently mashed all the apartment buzzers with the palm of his hand. He burped under his breath. Another nauseating wave of heartburn gurgled up the back of his throat. He smushed the flesh of his hand into the buzzer panel, touched them all. Above him, the insides of high-end apartments on this avenue in Chelsea buzzed. Jim Morrison, the unexpected visitor on the stoop outside, waited for someone, anyone, to let him in. It was almost three in the morning, not that that mattered. New York, the city that never sleeps. Jim had no clue what street he was on, but he knew this was the place. He had given the limo driver a vague set of directions, said he would keep an eye out the window and let him know when to stop. Just head to Chelsea, he instructed, in between hiccups. Just head to Chelsea, he said. Go to Chelsea. And then, here, right here, right here, here. This was the place. Jim was there to see one person in particular, Jack Holtzman, president of Electra Records. The guy who had taken a chance on the doors, taken a chance on Jim when no one else wanted to. The guy who had been there to nurture the band as they began storming the charts, setting new precedents. The guy who had gotten Tutti Camerata to chill the fuck out when Jim sprayed down Studio B at Sunset Sound after thinking it was on fire. Holtzman helped Jim attain his celebrity and also helped him get out of jams. But tonight, Holzman wasn't any of those things to Jim. Tonight, he was the guy who had missed the party. And fuck it, if Jack Holzman was going to be all antisocial and hide in his swank record executive pad here on shit, where the hell were they? Well, Jim would just bring the party to him. And the party that evening was in the wine cellar of the Delmonico Hotel on Park Avenue. Park Avenue, the nice part of town where Holzman grew up, the son of a doctor. And the party celebrated the Doors, their success in New York and their recent appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. It was a schmooze and booze fest, replete with New York writers, editors, radio people, groupies galore, even Andy Warhol and his entourage. Everyone was stoned, everyone was horny, half of the girls in the room wanted to fuck Jim, and half of the boys did too. Andy Warhol had been working an angle on Jim ever since the band started their stint at Ondine, a way hip club on East 59th. He wanted Jim to star in his new movie, simply called Fuck. An artsy skin flick, he wanted to film Jim fucking Nico, the stone-faced German blonde actress and model who was singing with the Velvet Underground, the New York band that Warhol had assembled. Jim kept putting Warhol off. The guy gave him the creeps. He looked like a school teacher, looked like a narc with that shocking white hair and unaffected stare. That stare, like he was sizing you up to drug you and eat you later, while simultaneously judging you. He would just stare at Jim and wait for him to talk to say the thing he wanted to hear, and when Jim didn't say it, Warhol's whole presence just got weirder. 
At the Ondine residency, Warhol would hover around Jim at the bar. Jim, racking up another bar tab, chased handfuls of pills with screwdrivers, the vodka to OJ ratio naturally favoring the vodka. Warhol watched girls sit at one of Ondine's little cocktail tables next to Jim and jerk him off while he descended deeper into total fucked upness. They'd pull his cock right out of his leather pants, wouldn't even try to hide it with the tablecloth overhang. Warhol lurked and watched. Once Jim caught him watching, but he was so drunk and high that he had no reaction. Judging by how hard the girl was working on him below the belt, Jim wasn't having much of a reaction to anything. Some nights, Jim would be carried out of Ondine and hauled back to the place he was crashing at on West 45th. He was Jim fucking Morrison. He could do what he wanted. He could take a cop's helmet, grab a girl on the side of the street and kiss her, spray down a recording studio with a fire extinguisher, show up piss drunk to a university homecoming, get himself a random hand job at a cocktail table, whatever, it didn't matter, 24 seven rock star shit. Someone at the Ed Sullivan show had tried to tell Jim Morrison what to do earlier that week, told him he couldn't do what he wanted. How did that go for you, Mr. Ed Sullivan show director, Mr. CBS bigwig? Jim got on national live television on the show that helped to turn artists like Elvis Presley and the Beatles into larger than life cultural icons. And during Light My Fire, saying the exact line the TV executive told him not to sing. Girl, we couldn't get much higher. If anything, he did it because he was told not to do it. The Ed Sullivan Show had famously censored Bob Dylan years earlier when they asked him to change lyrics to talk in John Birch paranoid blues. Dylan walked. And just recently, CBS had censored Pete Seeger when he sang Waist Deep in the Big Muddy on the Smothers Brothers show. And they weren't censoring Jim Morrison. Once again, he bit the hand that fed him, the hand that fed his band, the hand slapped back, and the doors were banned from the Ed Sullivan show. At the Delmonico party, Jim took what he wanted, drank what he wanted, did what he wanted. He smashed open champagne bottles and sloppily drank from the jagged edge. He grabbed vintage bottles of wine at random from the racks in the basement and smashed those open too, passed them around. Who needed a corkscrew when you had a strong arm and the edge of a wooden table? And at some point, he decided it was bullshit that Holtzman wasn't there. He found his way into a limo with some other partygoers. Destination, Chelsea. On the way out of the Delmonico, Warhol gave Jim an ivory and gold telephone. He said it was French. He was still trying to woo Jim for the fuck movie. As the limo picked up speed down Park Avenue, Jim rolled down the back window and tossed the phone at a trash can. Three points, he screamed. He never looked to see if he made the shot. After Jim had pressed on the apartment buzzer panel a few more times, he heard the lock on the door slide open. Someone just probably wanted the racket to stop. He was in. Holtzman was going to be so surprised when he opened his door and Jim was standing there. He had two bottles of champagne in his hand, and the party would continue. Jim had just stepped into the lobby when he felt it, and the heartburn raced up his throat again. He stumbled, shook his head as if he could simply shake off the uneasy feeling. The lobby began to spin. First, the walls got blurry, and then the staircase straight ahead began to vibrate and twirl. One of the champagne bottles slipped out of his hand and exploded on the lobby floor, the sound of breaking glass and fizzy alcohol reverberating through the first floor of the building. His left foot twisted up on him, and he reached out for a railing, a table, a surface, anything to brace himself. And there was no railing, table, or surface. He fell hard on his knees, and then the palms of his hands followed. Bent over, he vomited all over the swank Chelsea lobby. And the party, the wine, the champagne, the grass, the pills, the gold telephone, the Warhol stare, the Delmonico, it all came up. The whole evening splattered across the cold, shiny floor. And he felt like shit. But soon, he would feel even worse. And when he did, he'd find someone to blame and lash out. Jim Morrison was blind. His eyes burned like hell. They watered. 
The more he rubbed them with his knuckles, the more they felt like they were consumed by flames. The fiery sensation was in his nose, too, in his throat, like carbonated soda if the soda was made from fire. He felt his throat tighten up. It was swelling shut, and he was sure of it. He gasped for breath, felt around for the door of the bathroom stall with his hands, and tried again to open his eyes. And that only made it worse. And he'd never been maced before. And now, here in a bathroom backstage at the New Haven Arena, he'd gotten a taste. There was a first time for everything. He'd never played New Haven before, never pulled a random fan into the bathroom behind the dressing rooms either. Fucking police brutality in a little spray bottle, he thought. He could hear the girl screaming next to him. She likely caught a decent whiff of the stuff when New Haven's finest went all aggro on Jim. Jim was just trying to get a moment of privacy. He was trying to get in the girl's pants, if only for a quickie pre-show. And the bathroom was empty. And the stall called to him. He was rudely interrupted by the New Haven fuzz around the time he had the girl up against the wall of the stall. The cop appeared out of nowhere, told him to beat it, scram. He didn't seem to recognize Jim. To the cop, he was just another long hair that he got to order around. But Jim wasn't budging. That New Haven pig could fuck right off. Cause and effect. If Jim Morrison tells a cop to eat it while grabbing a hefty chunk of his crotch with his hand, then perhaps the cop will offer one last chance to submit to authority and clear out of the bathroom. And then if Jim Morrison replies with last chance to eat it and really doubles down on the obscene crotch grab, then the cop will likely reach into his pocket, pull out a small canister of mace and unload it into Jim Morrison's mug. Cause he's a smug motherfucker. Cause he has long hair. Cause he obviously wants to fight authority every chance he can get. The cop didn't care who he was. He just wanted to see what Jim would look like when he felt his face melting off. And he wanted to remind Jim that the cops had the power. Jim Morrison stumbled from the bathroom and tried to shake it all off. You never got me down, pig, he thought to himself. You never got me down. Contrary to what the New Haven cop thought, Jim firmly believed that he had the power. He was bigger than the police. He transcended authority. It was a person's innate right to challenge authority, to not accept reality for the sham that it was. That shit went all the way back to Thoreau, and he would set the example that others could follow. Others could buck conformity right along with him. He was continuing to become Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison, the rock star, leader of the biggest rock band in the country, the one who took no shit, answered to no one, the one who transcended it all. He brushed off his past life, brushed off his family like it was all dandruff on his collar. He denied he even had a family, denied his Florida man beginnings. After the record label told him he couldn't disappear into a new identity called James Phoenix, he took the Phoenix trajectory all the same, and rose from the self-constructed ashes of the bridge to his past that he'd burned down. Didn't want a military father that he had to impress and conform to. Didn't want a mother to dote over him. Didn't want a brother. Didn't want a sister. He was a lone wolf. He didn't need anybody. He'd make it on his own. Even with the doors, he was separate from the pack. Ray, Robbie, and John would have their own hang and Jim would be off on his own trip. He told everybody that his family was dead. He had no family. At a door show in Washington, D.C., Jim's mother Clara and his brother Andy came to finally witness Jim and his element. It had been so long since they talked, an eternity since they'd seen each other, and they went looking for him backstage. Jim had the band and crew run interference. Clara and Andy were routinely intercepted and redirected, promised visits by Jim that never happened. The show went on, the show ended, and everyone went home. Clara and Andy never got to see Jim. When the Doors finally went on stage in New Haven on that night in December, December 9, 1967, Jim once again assumed the role of the lone wolf leading a trio of brothers. His agonizing face pains had subsided, but the humiliation stuck with him. The humiliation he felt in front of the girl he was trying to impress. The humiliation he felt in front of Tommy and the Rivieras, the opening band, who were milling around backstage when he was maced. And there was something off about that opening. The way they stood around like a bunch of sheltered podunks. A bunch of pussies who had never taken a girl to a bathroom stall for the fuck of it. It was almost like they were taking great pleasure in watching Jim get roughed up by New Haven's finest. Like they were in on the joke. Maybe they called the cops to come bug him in the bathroom. Fuck it, Jim thought. They're just a nobody party band that plays a bunch of cover songs and gets the crowd warmed up for the real deal. I'm the real fucking deal. Jim Morrison, in The Doors. They didn't play a lot of cover songs, but when they did, they made them their own, doorsified them. Like Backdoor Man, the Willie Dixon blues song made famous by Howlin' Wolf. 
At 6'6 and 300 pounds, Wolf cut an imposing, almost mythical shadow in the Chess Records canon. For Jim, there was something mystical about Howlin' Wolf's music, something sinister and transportive, something defiant and singular. He rode a motorcycle on stage, drank bottles of liquor handed to him by audience members. He was testosterone incarnate. And when the Doors played Backdoor Man, Jim got to channel Wolf, let his inner Wolf out. It was during an instrumental break of this song at the New Haven show that Jim decided that he was done being humiliated for the evening. It was the cops' turn to be humiliated. The band vamped on the song's chug-a-lug groove low and steady, and Jim began to speak directly to the audience. How's everyone in New Haven tonight? The crowd roared back. We are in New Haven, right? New Haven, Connecticut? And this is the United States of America, right? Land of the free, home of the brave. And the crowd kept cheering in response. The band held steady on the song's bumpy groove. I thought it was America too, man. Someone ought to tell these little men in the blue shirts that this is America. These little fat men in the little blue shirts. Jim looked around for a cop in the audience and locked eyes. I was just looking for some privacy backstage, just a moment. Me and a girl, and this little fat man in a blue shirt. This little piggy comes up to me and says, what you doing, boy? The cop staring at Jim put his hand on his club and pulled it slowly from his belt. Jim blew a kiss at the cop as the band started to pick up steam. A little more urgent, a little louder now. Jim kept talking into the microphone. I said, I'm looking for some peace and quiet, officer. And then he told me, he said, I don't like your jerk-off attitude. I don't like your jerk-off face. And I don't like your jerk-off hair. I don't like you, jerk-off. The kids in the crowd began to stomp their feet, rattle the wooden chairs where they sat, and they were picking up what Jim was throwing down. And then, that little fat pig in the blue shirt pulled his little bottle from his belt and sprayed my eyes in my face. What the fuck, New Haven? The band came up. Ray's organ whining the lead melody while John landed some well-timed cymbal crashes. They were following Jim's lead, feeding off his energy. And now the audience was nervously laughing along with its cheers, stomping their feet louder and faster. The cops in the crowd, upwards of 30 of them, had begun to assemble to band together. The house lights suddenly came on and Jim howled undeterred. I'm your back door man! And there were cops on the stage now. Two approached Jim. One pulled the microphone stand away while the other slapped a pair of handcuffs on his wrists. A devilish smile crept across Jim's face. And then he looked out at the crowd and gave them a mock, who, me, facial expression. In Jim's mind, he was invincible. He was the wolf. The picture of the Wang Dang Doodle, the moaner at midnight, the truth teller, he exposed bullshit. He was also a trendsetter, the first musician to be arrested on stage during a performance. He made history. The cops were beginning to know him as something else entirely. Public enemy number one. Meanwhile, the crowd was confused, unsatisfied. Some tried to rush the stage to follow their fearless leader. Others spilled out into the New Haven night, looking to pick up steam on the heat that Jim had generated. And like the band vibing on Jim's words, the kids in the crowd didn't want to let the momentum die. And they picked up rocks, hurled them towards cops and cars. The cops broke out the mace bottles again and sprayed them at the young faces scurrying by. And Jim Morrison wasn't the only one arrested that night, a fact that he took as a sign of success. Now, if he could only get more buy-in from the audience, amp up the chaos, he'd wake up the next morning, inspired by the possibility that the chaos could be. We'll be right back after this word, word, word. Hey everyone, are you using your free time wisely? Are you using Audible? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. You need to subscribe to Audible if you don't already. You get two titles a month and daily access to great news sites like the Wall Street Journal. I use my subscription for books to research for Disgraceland, like The True Adventures of the Rolling Stones by Stanley Booth. This is a great book that I've used to research numerous Disgraceland episodes. This book is incredibly vivid, compelling, and I'm telling you, it's straight up gripping. 
And of course, I use Audible to be entertained as well. I've recently read James Elroy's This Storm. It's a new release. Uh, I dug into Audible to check out Elroy's past novels as well, which I love. It was cool to hear them in the sort of spoken word format. LA Confidential, American Tabloid. I highly recommend you check them out. I'm also very much looking forward to getting into David Mamet's new novel, Chicago, and listening to Beastie Boys' book that features a ton of different celebrity narrators, Snoop Dogg, Elvis Costello, Steve Buscemi, Kim Gordon, Chuck D, and many, many more. Of course, you can get my book, Disgraceland, Musicians Getting Away with Murder and Behaving Very Badly, narrated by yours truly, also at audible.com. And if you have trouble getting to sleep at night, Audible has this new thing where if you can't shut your brain off from the news, from the anxiety of the day, from whatever, you can check out Audible Sleep. It's uh, short, soothing audio experiences narrated by the likes of Diddy, Nick Jonas, and a bunch of others to help you wind down and get to sleep. Best part is you don't need to be a member to get in on this Audible Sleep action, but this content is only available for a limited time, so make sure you get in on it quick while you can. Guys, Audible is awesome. In this weird age we're living through with so much content, Audible for me is a place where I can centralize and consume all of the entertainment and information that I want. Get Audible. You'll be happy you did. I know that I am. Visit audible.com slash disgraceland or text disgraceland to 500-500. That's audible.com slash disgraceland or text disgraceland to 500-500. the kid had his arms spread wide. In his mind, the wingspan was even wider than it was in reality. His arms went the distance. From the crowd below, he looked Christ-like. Cliched, of course, but impossible to deny. He looked like Christ, but dumber than Christ. Christ wouldn't stand on a balcony railing like a dumbass. And this kid teetered on the rounded edge of the railing, just inches away from losing his balance and toppling to the floor, some 20 feet in the air. The audience below gasped at each muscle spasm and each jerk forward or backward that his body made. His leg twitched, his back sprang to the side, his outstretched arms flapped maniacally as his stone balance went to shit. Jim Morrison watched from the stage of the Chicago Coliseum and for a fleeting moment felt happy, contented. He had created this thing, this palpable sense of revolution, of nihilism, of anti-authoritarianism. Whatever it was, this sense that doing what you were told or what was expected of you was for the birds. He imparted this wisdom to the crowds at door shows, and the way he slunk around the stage, the way he whooped and hollered, the way he planted that seed of indiscriminate uprising in whoever would listen. He had said it before, on the stage of the whiskey, and though he didn't always use the same words, his message was still the same. Kill the father, fuck the mother, destroy what you love. Reality is not what you think it is. And now, it was starting to take shape. Jim was starting to slip into the role of existential conductor, and there was a kid standing on a balcony railing at the Chicago Coliseum, unfettered and free and fuck it all, and dumb too. Jim couldn't deny that idiocy was definitely part of it. And there was a kid on the balcony railing, and Jim had to smile devilishly and acknowledge that he made that happen. Jim looked at the balcony and thought about death too. Deaths on balconies. It had only been a month since Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis. Riots broke out in dozens of American cities, including right there in Chicago, and the world was still very fragile. Jimbo told Jim one night the King should have seen it coming, just like the hippies had it coming to them. Peace and love is a crock, he told Jim, five buds deep into an amuse bouche six pack. Peace and love got King killed. Fuck that shit. Jim thought about Martin Luther King Jr., thought about Jimbo, thought about death, about riots, about his connection to the kids who stood up and made a dash for the stage or climbed the railing in the balcony and dared to tempt fate. He thought about all those things as the kid let himself fall forward from the balcony. He dropped like a stone. Within the blink of an eye, the crowd below had parted and the kid belly flopped onto the Coliseum's hard floor. What? The entire room went silent. The kid jumped to his feet as quickly as he had fallen, his own personal Phoenix moment. The audience cheered. They felt empowered, ready to take the stage or do whatever needed doing. Jim smiled, a dream into action. The entire scene at the Coliseum gave Jim something to be happy about. 
In 1968, his rock star fantasy was beginning to become a not-so-sober game of diminishing returns. The Doors began the year starting to record their third album, Waiting for the Sun. Jim lobbied hard to get his epic poem song, theater piece, Celebration of the Lizard, on the record. But he was met by opposition from the group and Paul Rothschild, who had quietly become the fifth door by continuing to be an integral creative linchpin in the producer's scene. And the multi-part creation was so long that it would take up an entire side of the album. And no one but Jim liked it enough or could figure out a way to make it work. For Jim, Celebration of the Lizard transcended humdrum rock and roll to be something new, something daring, something unexpected, something that could be truly different. But to everyone else, it was confusing, too serpentine, it was too out there. It just wasn't something they were ready to tackle. And the other three Doors members liked being on the charts, and they wanted to stay there. It bummed Jim the fuck out. Waiting for the Sun was released in the summer of 1968. It hit number one on the Billboard 200. Its big single, Hello, I Love You, spent two weeks at number one. It was all Jim channeling Jimbo the theme song of a slick lecher gawking at hot young chicks strolling by on the sidewalk. While it sat atop the singles chart, the song shared space in the top five with Jose Feliciano's nylon stringed cover of the Doors single from their self-titled debut, Light My Fire. One night, Jim found himself near blackout drunk at a Chambers Brothers show that Jimi Hendrix was crashing. He snaked his way to the stage, wound himself around Jimmy's leg, and held on for dear life. When he was finally plucked from Jimmy's leg, his head met the end of a Jack Daniels bottle that was in the hand of Janis Joplin. He was humiliated. He felt dismissed by his own band in the studio and now dismissed by his peers in public. Maybe he was doing this rock star thing wrong. Maybe he had to tweak the fantasy. He tried again with Jimmy, this time at a show in Montreal. Jim positioned himself near the stage and when Jimmy and the experience had a break between songs, he made his move. Jimmy! Jim yelled, pointing at himself to draw attention. Jimmy! Can I jam with you? I'll come up there, we'll jam. Jimmy waved his hand at Jim, warded off the dark spirit. Nah, man, we're good. Jimmy, it's me, Morrison. I'm Jim Morrison, man. I know who you are, Jimmy replied, and I'm Jimi Hendrix. Jim stood there, expressionless, as the Jimi Hendrix experience jumped into the next groove, left Jim in the dust, begging for scraps on the side of the road. The Doors are one of the biggest bands on the planet, and Jimi Hendrix wanted nothing to do with him. Jim left, dejected. From there, he refocused. If he wasn't gonna find satisfaction as an artist, he would find it as an agitator. First, the Singer Bowl show in Queens. The kids were all right. The kids rioted. The wooden chairs flew and blood ran down their shirts. Then, in the latter part of 1968, the Doors launched a tour of the Midwest rife with unrest, violence, and routine rioting. Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis, Phoenix, the band hired armed bodyguards. By the time they got to Phoenix, Jim was ready to take it as far as he could go. I wanna see Phoenix flip the fuck out, he told the other guys in the band right as they took the stage. Jim was provocative as ever. He cursed, he made obscene gestures, he threw things at the audience, he wanted them to all do the same thing back to him. He wanted a mirror image. And then he went and chopped off his hair. And his sudden lack of lovely Greek god locks was national news. Bigger than his arrests, bigger than the civil disobedience he was curating coast to coast. But the cops weren't fooled by short hair and glamour shots. The cops wanted Jim. They had heard about the public arrest in New Haven, and they wanted to show some solidarity in Phoenix. And they were ready to bring the hammer down if Jim stepped over the line. In Phoenix, Jim danced all around the line, but didn't take it too far. They came close to putting him in cuffs, but reached a compromise instead. Get the fuck out of Phoenix and never come back. The doors weren't welcome there anymore. This was right around the time that the FBI opened up a file on Jim Morrison.
Jim Morrison's car emptied out as soon as it jumped the curb. The passengers knew they were lucky. It could have been so much worse. Jim's 67 Shelby GT500 Mustang could have hit a telephone pole, hit a building, hit another car, maybe a pedestrian. But instead, Jim slowed it to a coast and it bumped up on the curb. He had barely applied pressure to the brake pedal when the doors flung open and everyone ran for their lives. And they were getting out while the getting was good. Jim was drunk. Jim was often drunk. But at this moment, late at night in early December in West Hollywood, Jim Morrison was more drunk than usual. He had spent the last few hours tying one on at Doug Weston's Troubadour, the legendary club where Lenny Bruce was arrested for obscenity, where Joni Mitchell had recently made her local debut, and where Richard Pryor had just recorded his first live stand-up album. He sat at the bar, had the bartender set him up another round, and then another, one more, keep him coming. Hit on a girl, she blew him off. A couple of guys hit on him, and he blew them off. The Doors had just taped their first and only performance on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour earlier that evening. Robbie played it, sporting a juicy black eye, which he wouldn't let the makeup crew conceal. Depending on which story you believe, it was the result of a beatdown by a bunch of rednecks who didn't like the band's long hair, or Jim had given it to him. The band performed their new single, Touch Me, and its B-side, Wild Child, with its brass and strings, Touch Me was a more orchestrated and sonically adventurous sound for the band known for a more raw live in the studio feel. It also gave Jim room to stretch out his crooner chops and sing like one of his idols, Frank Sinatra. The crooner angle was played up on the Smothers Brothers performance. Jim, with his puffy black dress shirt and handheld gold microphone dangling his toe into schmaltzier waters, the elderly Smothers Brothers Orchestra in suits playing strings and horns behind him. The Doors had been recording their latest album at Electra's brand new state-of-the-art recording studio known as Electra Sound West on La Cienega Boulevard in West Hollywood. The string players came from the LA Philharmonic and the horn players were from the local jazz pool. George Harrison crashed the sessions and compared what the band was doing to the Beatles' work on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. When the soft parade was released in early 1969, it had cost the band $80,000 to make, eight times what it cost to record their debut. After the Smothers Brothers taping, Jim went lone wolf again and parted ways with the band. He found himself at the Troubadour's bar, found himself surrounded by a chick who he wanted and a couple of dudes who wanted him. The last call came and Jim had the great idea to take them all for a spin in his Shelby. The Night Mist Blue Shelby Mustang was a gift from Electra's Jack Holtzman when Light My Fire went to number one. He asked the band what they wanted for taking Electra all the way to the top of the charts. Ray and Robbie asked for swanky reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. John wanted a horse. Jim was in love with the Shelby GT350 that his hairstylist Jay Sebring had driven all over town. It was a gearhead's dream and a babe magnet at the same time. Jim called it the Blue Lady. He climbed into the Blue Lady with his new friends, and as soon as they pulled out onto Santa Monica Boulevard, the neon burning from every building on the block assaulted his drunk eyes. The roads spun, the streetlights sizzled and sparked. Jim didn't get far until he jumped the curb, and his passengers soberly realized that a ride with a drunk Jim Morrison probably wasn't worth risking their lives for. Jim worked up the courage to get the Blue Lady back on the street again. It was late after hours, and Hollywood nightlife was lurking in the shadows. The streets themselves were open, but it was eerily quiet. Jim had no idea what time it was, and he couldn't get his eyes to focus so that he could read the clock on the dash. And Jim pulled the blue lady back onto Santa Monica Boulevard. Steady, keep her steady. He threw it in first gear and felt the purr of the engine as his right foot gently pressed the pedal toward the floor. Second gear, steady, stay focused and the GT500 hummed as Jim tried to get his bearings and find his way back to the Tropicana Hotel for a $29 a night bed. He was contemplating third gear when he went through an intersection. He didn't know if the light was green or red, and maybe there wasn't a light at all. Who knows? Fuck it. He didn't slow down. The intersection came, and the intersection went, and out the window he saw a blurry street sign alert him that he was now on Sunset Boulevard. He snapped the radio on. The coda of Diana Ross and the Supreme's love child was playing. The tambourine, the glockenspiel, the strings. Jim rode to the beat, and he grabbed the stick shift tight with his right hand and sang at the top of his lungs, I always love you, oh, I always love you. The telephone pole 
will stop the blue lady immediately. When it jumped the curb for a second time, then Jim's head flapped back against the seat back as the front end of the car connected with the pole. The shocking crunch of metal and wood, the impatient hiss of something busted under the hood, Diana Ross's yearning lead vocal fading out. Jim stumbled onto the street and assessed the blue lady's current situation. He felt around his body to make sure he was still in one piece, ran his hand through his hair. Steam rose in the December air from the front end of the car where it was connected to the telephone pole. If this wasn't a colossal fuck-up, he didn't know what was. But colossal fuck-ups like this were too difficult to unfuck up He felt temporarily sober and needed to find another bar to regain his composure. And where the hell was Bob Newworth? Newworth entered the door's orbit recently under the guise of documentary filmmaker. He was a Zelig type of shadow figure at the birth of the music scenes in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Nashville, Austin, and Santa Monica. A songwriter, a roadie, a sideman. He was at Newport, at Monterey, at Woodstock. So it was only natural that Newworth would be on the scene to follow Jim and the Doors on tour and shoot footage for an upcoming documentary about the band's life on and off the stage. But Newworth wasn't there just to shoot footage. Newworth was there to be Jim's wrangler, keep tabs on the lone wolf. Newworth would keep up with Jim with his drinking, his partying, his wolfing. But Jim was squirmy, squirmy enough that he'd disappear to the troubadour and then wrap his car around a telephone pole before anyone was the wiser. As Jim went crazy on Sunset Boulevard, the rest of the nation and the world went crazy right along with him. Nixon was in, Vietnam was on, Jim was about to dive deeper, push everything, his music, his poetry, his insane behavior further, and blur the line between what was real and what was fantasy. It was a deep dive, one that no one in Jim's orbit could prevent. Not even Bob Newirth. I'm Jake Brennan, and this is the 27 Club. The 27 Club is scored and co-written by myself, Jake Brennan. Zeth Lundy is the lead writer and editor on the show. Matt Bowden mixes the show. Additional music and score elements by Ryan Spraker and Henry Lunetta. The 27 Club is produced by myself for Double Elvis in partnership with iHeartRadio. Sources for this episode are available at DoubleElvis.com on the 27 Club series page. The 27 Club is released weekly every Thursday. Season 1 features 12 episodes on Jimi Hendrix, which are all available for you to binge right now, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please be sure to subscribe to The 27 Club on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your shows. And if you'd like to win a free 27 Club poster designed by the man himself, Nate Gonzalez, then leave a review for 27 Club on Apple Podcasts or hashtag subscribe to 27 Club on social media. And we'll pick two winners each week and announce them on the Double Elvis Instagram page. That's at Double Elvis. You're going to want to give that a follow. So get out there and spread the word about 27 Club. And as always, you can find me blabbing about other crazy rock stars on my other show, Disgraceland. And you can talk to me per usual on Instagram and Twitter at DisgracelandPod. Rock and